All good. Um, so next up we have Paul Schultz. Um, Paul is from Adelaide with a background in physics and mathematics. Uh, he's done various roles in the past, including Linux systems administration and has hacked on various hardware devices. Um, and he's going to be giving us a talk on Linux, cosmic rays and art installations. Please welcome Paul. How's that? Is that better? All right, well, ha ha happy to have you here. Um, I know I'm up against a couple of uh, other interesting talks as well, um, including one called Everyone Gets a Pony. So, um, uh, so this was a project. Uh, we built this piece of equipment here. We built 16 of those, and I'm, I'm going to talk about what we did and how we did it. Um, uh, um, and it's also about muons as well. So the, what we're actually detecting in, these, in this detector here are muons which um, are caused by cosmic rays. All right. um, it was done in a collaboration. Um, Robert Hart um, is the fellow that, that built the hardware, um, and Darren Curtis. Um, Robert and Darren had collaborated previously on other um, cosmic ray detection and um, art projects. Um, Darren's a um, musician. He did his um, electronic music at Adelaide Uni, and they essentially building machines that detect muons and their events and um, get them to make noise and sound and light, um, which is what we're seeing right here with this one. I'll actually um, just unplug him or we'll maybe fire him up again later. Um, and then myself, um, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Linux Australia and um, Linux Conf AU for um, accepting my talk um, and also my family who I know are watching. So thank you very much. Um, just a quick photo. This is actually a group. Um, Robert particularly likes collaborating. Um, this is actually a group in Europe that built another muon detector based on his, his circuit, his work. Um, he was collaborating with them, and this was posted sort of, um, they, they built it as part of their class activity. Um, and then this is actually a photo of them visiting CERN um, in Europe um, with, their, with their experiments. So it's, um, there's a whole lot of ways. We'd, we'd love to be more involved in, in getting schools in. Um, building these things and um, and working with with um, uh, the technology. Um, so, what are cosmic rays? Um, I won't, there won't be too much in the way of science. I've hidden an equation in this in this picture. For those people that know particle physics, you'll you'll get the you'll get the joke. Um, what we've got are protons and helium nuclei coming from the cosmos, from outer space. They're not from the sun. They're from extrasolar cosmic sources traveling at um, high energies. Um, these particles are actually um, orders of magnitude greater in energy than anything we can produce on Earth in our atom smashes like CERN and um, uh, linear accelerators. So they're, they're a place where um, real science can be found um, and unique science. It's, we, we can't replicate it elsewhere. So what happens is a proton, for instance, comes into the atmosphere, it hits another proton, um, they're made up of quarks, the quarks get scattered um, and you produce um, uh, other particles, these pions, which are quark-anti-quark -quark pairs, um, which then further decay. Now the, um, the other interesting thing about the process is it involves a whole lot of um, uh, particle physics um, in terms of the, the strong interaction, so the proton collision is mandated by the strong nuclear, react nuclear force. Um, which is what radioactivity is all about. So the, and then the, the decay of this pion, this intermediate particle, um, is caused by the weak nuclear force, um, which is also the force that's responsible for um, some of the stuff that happens in the sun, why our sun doesn't burn out as quickly as it does, um, because of this weak interaction. And the, the Feynman diagram on the end um, is sort of showing the weak interaction, so the um, that the up and the down quarks come together, form a, a W meson, and, and then we get our muon um, and an anti, so the muon, the, the mu minus, and a an muon neutrino. Um, and it's the muon that we actually detect um, with, our, with our detector. Um, this is really the, the cosmic rays are really the only source of muons around us, um, and we're seeing at, at Earth, at ground level, we're seeing a sort of flux of about 100,000 
of these passing through every square metre every minute. So it's something that's around us all the time, and we don't really notice it. Um, the atmosphere is doing a great job of protecting us from these protons and, and helium nuclei. Um, so approximately 120 to 130 of these per second per square metre. Uh, and there's nothing we can do about it. Th there is some um, effect due to the Earth's magnetic field with regards to east and west and latitude regards to the rate, but it's purely cos cosmic um, phenomenon. Um, so it's uh, something that's, that's there and around us all the time. This kind of shows what happens. So that, that last picture was just one process where, where I was producing news. It's actually a whole lot of scattering. These cosmic ray showers are caused by this event at the top. Um, and this pi, the pi minus, the first green line is sort of the process I'm, I'm looking at, but there's a whole bunch of other processes as well from um, photons and, and gamma rays being produced to uh, more protons and neutrons um, to more exotic particles with your, with your pi's plus and pi minus. And we're, we're looking at the pi pions, the pi, the negative pi's in this case. Um, how, do we, how do we detect them? Um, in the box, and we'll come to in a sec, we've got a couple of um, Geiger tubes. So if you've seen the movies, you've seen these in, in a science lab somewhere, they're the things that go tick when, they, when you detect an ionising source. So a particle, charged particle, or a gamma ray flies through a tube, hits the tube, um, causes electrons to be knocked off from the gas that's in the tube, be it um, um, neon or um, uh, one of the other noble gases. Um, you have a high voltage across the tube, typically 400 volts in our case, and you get a small current which corresponds to a small dip in the voltage, and you can measure that. And what we're looking for, um, so the, the, the Geiger tubes um, measure that. We, if we're only interested in the muons, and the way we um, get those details, or just the muons, is we, we have two tubes, so we're looking for a simultaneous event between the two of them. Um, alpha will, will typically get blocked by pretty much anything. Um, they're, they're the slow, move, well, slow moving helium nuclei. Beta will propagate probably through one of the tubes. Gamma will get stop, sort of stopped by the metal shielding. And it's only these muons um, that will pass through both and register on both tubes and um, give us a, a simultaneous event on both. Um, so, the question was, given that these are all around us all the time and we've got a way of detecting them, how can we make this interesting? Um, so Robert and um, Darren are saying have collaborated previously on some of these detectors. Um, for instance, he created a smaller, a small version with um, sort of nine tubes crisscrossed so he could get a lattice and he was looking for simultaneous events between two layers. And he fed that into a computer and produced some music. Um, I'm going to play a video at the end, and the music on that was produced by that machine. Um, uh, what we wanted to do was step that up, and so they came up with this plan where we had an array across the, across the ground. So these showers will spread out over uh, maybe a kilometre or so, um, and they sort of give some sort of indicate with multiple of them going off simultaneously um, with some sort of direction what's what's going on and what are, what, what are we seeing in, in that case. So that was kind of the original idea of having this array of detectors. How, how would we go about doing this? Um, one of the things about Adelaide is they, they're full of festivals. And one of the festivals that they, they like in the winter is this one called Splash. Um, and you can read it up there. Um, what do Adelaideans do in the middle of winter? We, we want, we want to make things a bit interesting, so they introduced this festival and, and there was some arts funding. So we were able to pick up $2,000 towards the project to help us build these things. Um, one of the themes um, about this particular project is that we tried to do it as cheaply and as efficiently as possible, um, which created its own problems. Um, and I can allude to some of those, but we picked up some, mon some money from Splash, um, care of um, Darren um, and his art background. Hackaday. Um, one of the, also, one of the other things that Robert likes to do is put his projects up on Hackaday. Um, they have various sections and competitions. Um, the IIT section, um, in, that case, in this case, we entered. Um, originally, the idea was that we would use mechanical devices like um, solenoids hitting chime bars to make sound. 
Um, but he was a source of funding, so I whacked a Raspberry Pi in there. Well, that was the plan. Uh, and we entered the, IS, the Internet of Things section, so there's Wi-Fi in there. Um, and we actually won that, so we picked up $1,000 for that particular section this, this last year in 2017. Um, and that's the, the URL there. Um, it's got all the logs. So all of this um, material we've made available, it's open source and, pub and um, free in the sense of um, freedom. Um, uh, what else can I say about that? We, we didn't win the overall Hacker Day prize. We lost out to a submersible, which is kind of okay because these things don't do well in, I mean, wouldn't do well underwater. Um, saying that though, um, we, had some, we had a bit of money um, and that was sort of the plan for the, for the installation we were going to do. So we have um, three tubes on the top left there detecting muons and I'll talk about how, how they do that. Um, some electronics that um, shape the pulses that we get out of the tubes and then a way of um, flashing some lights and making some sound um, both inside the box and because the machine, so because there's a, a Raspberry Pi in there, um, we could submit, so transmit packets, um, events over the network um, which were received and, and audio was, was played to correspond to that. And then so, um, in, that, in the sort of scale of where people can sit down and, and overlook this um, on, a, on a lawned area. Um, and that's what we did. We got, we got um, some funding, we got some tents, um, and we were open for two days um, over, over September, um, Saturday and Sunday. It rained Sunday, so we're a bit late setting up there, but um, we, people could come during the day, we had a display in the tent, and then at night um, they'll see the, see the event happening. So what I might just do is cross over to... Uh, oh, my video. So this, we, um, this is Darren with his YouTube shout out. And uh, I'll come back after he's finished. And Myself, uh, Darren Curtis, at Valley Let Pitch. me just... I welcome you to, you to come down and experience the Cosmic Ray. So I'm just going to take you through a tour of the Cosmic Array. So as we can see here, we have some of the samples. Prototype, number seven, with the Geiger tubes. LEDs, an earlier prototype of Cosmic Ray Detector some of the circuit boards that go with it, some of the uh, cosmic arrays, um, some of the insert, what you would see out in the actual field. And we also have a live feed over a network coming in here to my laptop. Um, and you can sort of see over the riverbank all the different detectors here. 16 individual detectors on the riverbank, all making unique sounds. We're looking back towards our tent for Cosmic Array. You can hear some of the beautiful sounds that have been triggered by these muons coming from Cosmic Rays deep within space. We open all day today from 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. It's a free event. Uh, please come down and talk to some of the artists. Come down and have a drink at the regatta bar. And it's going to be lovely at night here. So as we can hear the um, different cosmic rays coming down in showers and muons triggering these unique 
detectors using Geiger tubes. They're detecting muons from deep space, from cosmic rays, transmitted into sounds. And the sounds are from the Koshi bells. People would know those. They sound like wind chimes. So as a muon hits the detector, triggers off a sound and a different colour depending on the detection. So come down and explore Muon on the lovely Adelaide Riverbank. So thank you, I'm Darren Curtis. Uh, we're Secret Residents um, with Hardhack, Robert Hart, Paul Slutes, yep, um, the coding Sorry. person, and also Bradley Pitt, also working with the Sacred Residence, and to Splash Adelaide, Adelaide City Council, um, for this amazing spot here on the River Torrens. So, hope you enjoy, and um, yeah, we have an opening night tonight at uh, 6 pm uh, at the Regatta Bar. Um, come down and um, hear the artists speak, and yeah, get to chat to us a bit and see them light up at night. I uh, thank you, signing out. So, um, so that was Darren, um, our artist, who went on a bit, and that's sort of a, a picture of it at night, and again I'll show a video at the end. Um, a bit harder to see um, with the exposure time, but there's, a, there's that picture's there the, um, of the layout, um, and a couple of them going off in the corner. So about the detector itself, um, I'm saying we've got one of these here. Um, uh, not too hard to scrub what's going on. Um, we've got a set of LEDs in the top, so there's nothing much, I mean, Bunnings um, outdoor lighting fixture. Um, and then inside, um, we've got the, the layout as such. So the, the main board at the top um, is one that Robert built and got fabbed um, himself. Um, the, the board on the left there is a 400 volt supply. Um, Raspberry Pi, the Geiger tubes in their copper shielding, uh, and then a, an um, audio amplifier, which I'll talk about as well. Um, uh, how did it... Um, yeah, so close-up of the tubes, um, there's underneath. Um, there's a whole bunch of things we discovered about shielding. Um, was, this was a, a, um, a rework that Robert had to do with, with regards to putting some um, coax um, on the lines. Um, the board itself, uh, we've got, I made a mistake yesterday, I saw Monday when I was talking about it, but it's Express PCB. This particular one's the version 7. Um, it doesn't have the, the connectors on it, the new version. Actually, I might just, I've got a couple of them here. I don't know if you just want to have a look and pass them back. If you want to have a look, a bit of a close-up. Um, on the right, on the left-hand side there, you've got the... Um, Processing for the, the tubes, um, the, the 400 volt supply comes in the top, um, and then on the other side of that dotted line, um, the various signals get transmitted. Um, we've got a bunch of 555 timers, that's those um, little chips there that do the, the, the signal processing in terms of um, looking for simultaneous events. And then um, the then the, the signals eventually come out, either off to the LEDs or um, out to the Raspberry Pi. Um, so the red, green, blue channels at the bottom there, and the rest is, is part of the power supply. We, we had a 12, so the thing can be driven from um, 19 to 24 volts, pretty much. Um, so a laptop um, a power supply, uh, minimal current. Um, I had, you can have it running, um, I had it running from a small, off a small LED, uh, small gel cell battery, all 16 for about an hour. Um, and the, the high voltage power supply it's, itself is reasonably safe because it's um, high impedance, so there's not a whole lot of energy there. You just, um, just don't want to be touching things that... It, it won't kill you, it might tickle a bit. Um, there's the, some of them made up. Um, so it's a bit of effort. And this is, so this is the version 8, and, you can, and um, Robert's put more connectors on it. Um, the, the layout and the routing on the boards is done by hand. Um, and he actually, well, when we went from version 7 to 8, um, there was actually a track that was missed. Um, we'll see if you can spot it there somewhere. Um, but that's, 
uh, that was version 8. Um, this is actually the, the circuit that Robert usually uses for his detectors. So the tubes are on the left there. Um, you get, a, get the inverse pulse from the tubes as the, as the a particle goes through and energizes the, ionizes the gas. Um, there's some shaping of the pulse to make it square, uh, inverse, and then you've got an AND gate from the two tubes that looks for the synchronous events. Um, like I was saying, that's his usual circuit. Um, we went for something sim simpler for this one. Um, simpler in the sense that that's, that we just, he used the 555 timers, um, less components, um, introduced its own issues. Um, but then you can see with the, the three, we've got um, three of the AND gates, and as well as a fourth one for a, a white, um, if all three go off. Um, that was uh, interesting, to say the least, because you don't expect that, but it was actually happening. Um, and then goes off to the LEDs at the, at the top right, and the, the power supplies down here. In the, um, and, that's, and that was the layout of the, of the board. Um, what else can I say about that? Um, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll, if I, at the end, if I can, if, um, when I'm talking about sort of lessons, we can, we can talk about that a bit more. Um, the rest of the components, so the case, the J-car, acrylic, um, sort of lighting shop, some PVC pipe and copper pipe from Bunnings, um, the LED lighting and the power connectors, DigiKey, and various other bits and pieces. Um, and then we came, then we had the ras Raspberry Pi. So I've just talked about all the hardware. Um, the Raspberry Pi was, was kind of interesting. So we put it in sort of after the initial design. Um, it used five volts um, from the five volt that we were using for the logic. Um, the particular bits that, from the Raspberry Pi that we were, we originally were looking at a Raspberry Pi 3. Um, they're a bit expensive, so, look, so we went to the Raspberry Pi Zero Wireless. Um, uh, $12, $13 um, from Core Electronics, and we were using the following features. So two core CPU, a bit of RAM, um, the micro SD, the, um, the header file there, header pins to get the data in and out, um, and the wireless. And sort of the wireless was, the, the reason for including the, the wireless was again this IoT section of Hackaday and, and some money. So we were able to get some money. What you notice, what you notice that's not in that specification list is audio. Um, so we had to have a workaround, and we managed to, to get one. Other people hit the same problems. Um, so it was kind of interesting that part of the reason for the device was to make sound, and yet we put in a Raspberry Pi that didn't have sound. Anyway, um, the other thing was um, it was available from Core Electronics, but it was one per customer. Um, doing the maths, that, and we needed 16. So that's 16 from 16 customers. Um, so we actually w put a call out to our um, local hackerspace on the email list uh, and made them an offer. Um, if they would like to order one of these for us, uh, we would pay for shipping, including anything else that they would like to order at the same time. Uh, please be reasonable. And we actually got more than um, 16 in the end, um, and it worked out quite well. But there are ways and means around, get around getting um, um, purchasing restrictions. Um, and it was, it was good. Like it was, we, we got them in the, in the month that we needed. Audio. Um, so the, the Raspberry Pi has um, some PWM, pulse width modulated outputs. Um, in the actual Raspberry Pi 3, um, that's how they drive their audio to the, to the audio output, the jack. Um, so we had to build the same circuitry um, and tack it on. Um, and there are, there is, when you boot um, the Linux kernel on the Raspberry Pi Zero, um, there's some code that you can get overlaid, which will push the, the, the audio, the regular Linux audio, out through the PWM. Um, it wasn't brilliant. Um, it, you wouldn't want to be what, listening to your hi-fi um, MP3s over it, but it worked. Um, and with, in, in, the, in the outdoor environment, I mean, the, the other problem was that with the um, amplifier, um, incredibly high gain. Um, any noise on those inputs um, caused crackles and pops, and, and you could hear me logging into it remotely over SSH, uh, which is kind of interesting. 
um, so shielding, etc., goes a long way. Um, and I also bought 16 um, micro SD cards to go in it, and popped Raspbian on that. Um, so what was this? So coming to my bit, what was what did the software need to do? Um, really, only two things. One was play an audio file um, and send a message over the network so that the other laptop could do it. So there wasn't a whole lot to do. Um, uh, how did we do that? Um, there's a for the Raspberry, Raspberry and the Raspberry Pi, there's a library called Wiring Pi. Um, here's just the sort of the snippet. Um, so it was, um, I implemented um, an interrupt handler in, in Wiring Pi in C, um, and that sort of is the, the, the main part of the code. The, the Wiring Pi SR allows you to register, in this case, my interrupt zero. I had three interrupts for the three different red, green, and blue, and then within that, command, I just ran the system and played with A play, and it worked. Um, the Cosmic Ray Send, again, another little C program, um, went back to the info pages for GNU and, and libc, um, found their example for um, a UDP server uh, packets, and just um, built a packet and sent it out over a socket. Um, we weren't worried about um, TCP um, handshaking, if a, if a packet was lost going out, well, it was lost going out, and we were just ending up playing a sound. So there was lots of things that we did um, that just worked, and we're not being particularly scientific or engineering about it. Um, it was an art ex exhibit installation. So at the end of the day, um, if you sit back and, and go, wow, then our job was done. Um, so it was, that wasn't too bad. The actual format, on the, of the events that went out, so each, each line is, was a packet. Um, uh, I'd send the name of the particular unit, um, a big Unix timestamp, um, the channel 0, 1 or 2, and then a, a serial number. So that part of the idea was maybe later I could look at some, some of the events and the, do some statistics or something. Um, in the end, we lost the, the um, we, I removed the, the timestamp, um, again, it wasn't strictly needed for the, for the art, um, but again, it, it sort of worked. Um, so in terms of the software on it, um, we used Raspbian on the Raspberry Pi, um, war, the Wiring Pi library um, to get the thing to boot when it starts up, um, Crontab and at, re, at um, reboot, um, Bash and SSH to do things on it. Um, all of it's on the GitHub repository. Um, and then to control and look at the, be able to update all 16 at once, um, some Ansible playbooks um, that let me to simultaneously like connect in and, and at the end of the, we, the update process was log in um, and run git pull from, the, from GitHub if these things were on a network and that worked reasonably well. Um, like anything, um, that was sort of the, the morning of the setup. Ran, uh, frantically reinstalling or updating the, the software that's on the devices just before they go out. Um, I think that's a common story in situations like this. Um, and then that's sort of a close-up of the software that was running on, the, on Darren's laptop, um, something called Max MSP, I believe. Is, uh, I haven't seen any open source type stuff. I mean, Jack is an audio, some audio stuff that might be similar. Um, it had a, a plug-in that allowed it to sniff the network and get UDP packets. Um, and then depending on uh, greps on the contents of that, it kicked off other things. In this case, they were audio, the playing of audio files. So from his point of view, all he did was get packets and kick off events. And that's what made the sound that was um, coming out of the tent as well as the devices. Um, that's kind of the the hardware and the software. Um, how are we going for time? Okay. Uh, I'm blazing along. Um, in terms of the science, um, so this was um, 10 days up in January. I, I fired it up and just recorded, um, and it's pretty flat, other than the random um, events. I, I just wanted to see what was going on. Um, for those people that are interested, um, I was using IPython, um, NumPy, and Pandas. Um, sort of a day playing with it. Um, and you can get some pretty graphs. 
Um, uh, lessons learned. So there were a couple of things. Um, when we attached the um, Raspberry Pi to the voltage, to the, to the five volt voltage, which really wasn't designed to, to have a Raspberry Pi hanging off it. Um, if we go back to uh, my vent messages, um, what you might notice um, on sort of the second, third, and fourth, fourth line, we've got zero, two, and the triggering zero, two, and zero, so one, two, and zero. Um, they're all very close together. And what we're, we're getting, what was happening is because these, the 555 timers um, trigger when, when the voltage drops. Um, and what would happen was that one, one event would come through, um, it would trigger an event, the Raspberry Pi would kick up and, and start playing a file, um, the voltage would drop on the supply. Uh, and so then all the others would trigger. Um, so in this case, channel one would come in, and then very soon after that, so that's 0 0.7 and at 0.84 and 0.85, the other two channels triggered as well. So quite often that was, I mean, that was one of the things that, um, not me, um, we saw happening. Um, what Robert did to get around that, and, and if you come up, you, you'll see it. We've got a couple of Zeno diodes across the supply to the 555s, um, which would hold the voltage down so that we could have a little bit of voltage ripple on the um, but it wouldn't affect the actual triggering until a, a big event, a main event came through and then it would, would happen. So that was one of the um, uh, lessons. Um, I'm trying to think what else, there's, um, what, uh, things to do and things for the future. Um, we want to build the next version, um, and we want to include a solid state detector. So these are um, the gas tubes. Um, they're more expensive, so we are looking at, at selling these off. If you're interested in buy buying one, <laughs> um, thanks, John. Uh, I'll pass on Robert's details, and we can we can ship one, or we can probably even have this one. And it's, it'll save me having to take it on the plane again. Uh, I'll come talk to me about that later. It was a bit interesting. Um, um, the, and what else can we do with it? Um, so, like I was saying, the, the actual um, events are from cosmic rays, so they're, they're cosmic, they're random, they're constant. Um, I used them, um, uh, what else could you do with a random source? I actually used it to generate some Bitcoin wallet addresses, because I could. Um, you can generate Bitcoin wallet addresses by rolling a D6 like 99 times, um, that'll give you what you need. Um, so I just used red, green, and blue channels to generate some, some random uh, some D6 type events and um, did that. Um, so was that counting down or counting up? Counting down, ah, oh, fantastic. Um, uh, I've had someone approach me, I'm not sure if they're here, uh, about cosmic uh, muon detection in um, in caves. Um, some people, you might have seen in um, December, there was a big announcement um, that they'd found some voids in the Great Pyramid um, using muons, and it's a similar process. They had muon detectors situated around the pyramid. Um, I think they moved them around, but they looked for um, rate, changes of rates of the de of detection, depending on the, um, and depending on the material above them, you could infer that there was rock here and not rock there. Um, and if you, look at, if you can look at directions, then they can get some tomography to actually say, well, we, we believe there's a, a void in this particular part of the pyramid, or if you're in caves, there's, there might be caves around, um, which is a bit, um, I mean, it's very easy to, uh, to go digging in Minecraft, a bit hard to do that in the, in the real world if you want to find voids, um, or if you're hunting for lava or whatever, uh, or diamond. Um, um, one of the things that I'd, I'm keen to do is, is, for instance, remove the, the copper shielding and do some more with um, just signal processing in an FPGA. Um, so that was something that was useful. Um, and you can look at um, uh, synchronous events on the, on the tubes. Um, and, and then you could also use it to measure background radiation as well. So you could then use it for environmental type um, and the monitoring. 
Um, I think that's about all that I was going to say. Um, um, that was a quote from Robert, and I was saying I've got some available. Um, and what, I'll probably, what I'd like to do is, is play another video of, of, with the whole stack of photos of the construction process, um, and I'm happy to take questions um, while that plays. I might just put that back. So that'll quite happily play, and it's in about seven minutes I'll, I'll turn it back on. There's a video of the actual installation itself. Any questions? Oh, John. Um, after, after the event, so yes, yeah, so the question was, yeah, so the question was um, with 16 of them, and I'll, I'll put this one back on, the, the rate of the flashing was uh, interesting. It wasn't too fast, it wasn't too slow. Um, that was deliberate in the, in the design process. There's, the tubes that were put in there um, are a particular size. We went for a smaller one. Um, so each individual detector triggers maybe once every three to five seconds. Um, so over 16, you'd get every second something. One or two. So um, it was a, it was a ch choice, but there's not a whole lot of tuning you can you can do with the Cosmos Cosmos once you've built the hardware. Um, sorry, the yes, yes. So uh, the hard the, there's nothing we can do to change the rate um, once the once the hardware's uh, built, designed. Um, yeah. Um, I, don't, I suppose one thing I didn't, the actual, the colours, um, so you've, so we've got the two, two, three tubes um, arranged vertically, yes. Like, um, we're looking for simultaneous events on two of those, and that gives us the red, green, and blue channel, so we get some sort of indication of direction. Um, and the other thing is, I mean, I, I'm not sure how tall the building is in front of us, but the muons are still reaching us. So they're coming down, they're, they're getting through everything that, and we're still getting events, so. Um, in the, so the question was, is the, is the audio related? No. Um, the, yeah, yeah, the audio, we, we, the audio plays differently to the red, green, and blue channels, which is kind of direction. Um, but the, uh, with the 16 of them, we actually, each detector had a different set of audio files to play, um, which made it, again, more interesting because there was more going on. Yes? How did it go in the weather? Um, fine. So it's waterproof, um, but the, so how did it go in the weather? Um, the box is waterproof. Um, Robert did a good job of doing that. Um, uh, on, the, on the Sunday, it was actually quite wet. In the morning, so I was mainly just getting people to set things up in the rain um, after the night before. So we only sort of got started at one o'clock in the afternoon on that. Yes? Uh, the question was, have we tried to take it into a, in, in, a, in a balloon? No. Um, I have thought of that. Um, we, we would probably have to make something a bit smaller and put it in some styrofoam um, to get it up there. The oh, interesting. Oh, <laughs> well, not not so not so much. I mean, I I'm a, I am interested in, in maybe somehow getting it on a a, um, a plane like operating, um, but I'm not sure who who I would have to explain what to to get make that. I mean, I've got a brother-in-law who flies for Qantas, and it, like they're concerned about so the radiation does increase as you go higher, um, and they must have some. The, the, they must know the, the medical. Um, rates, etc., for, for that, those sorts of flights, but um, uh, there's nothing there's nothing radioactive or inherently dangerous in it. Just try convincing someone that uh, they, those don't look dangerous. Um, yeah. 
I, I didn't have to do that. I put, I put it through on, um, on checked in, but yeah, it, um, I was a bit worried about make, making sure it would still worked when I got here. Um, yes, sorry. Yes. Oh, so the, yep. Um, so the question was, does the orientation of the tubes affect the detections? Um, the way that the uh, the way uh, my understanding is that with the, the flux around us, it's coming down from the atmosphere. There's more from the east than from the west because of the way the Earth's rotating. Um, the tubes, um, uh, we would range them vertically so that we could get our um, azimuth like direction, the selection that way rather than horizontal. Um, previous, Robert had done previous machines, so sort of there we go with the, the tubes and some, a bit of an animation. Um, uh, had done horizontal tubes looking for direction, that, like looking at paths vertically, um, so we were looking for something a bit different. And so having, them, having the tubes vertical gave us sort of some angular um, horizontal um, resolution. Yeah, so that, for instance, a muon goes through two of them and we look for simultaneous events, giving us a red, green or blue um, signal. Yes, sure. Yes, uh, like I was mentioning, the, um, when one triggered, yeah, false, false positive, um, uh, and so, yeah, so that was, and, and the other thing is that the pulse that we're using with the 5.5 timers isn't narrow, we, it was set up to, to beat uh, 250 milliseconds for the, for the LEDs so you can still see a flash. Yeah, if, if something triggered them within that period, it would, it would register as white. Um, any other questions? Other yes, sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what triggered it. Sorry, so two oh, from two separate units. Um, we weren't we weren't expecting that. If you watch closely enough, you'll get simultaneous detectors going off at the same time, and more than likely, that's from a single shower happening. Um, you can sit there and watch it. Um, that was a good game for the kids, right? Which one's going to go off next? Um, and you sit there just watching, um, and it was, yeah, quite a lot of fun. Okay, I'll restart this, and um, sorry, any other questions? Yes, Robin. Yes, that's what's coming up next. Sorry, the question was, do I have video coming up tonight? Um, I might as well just, uh, so this will this will finish and then go into that. Uh, I think that's the last picture again of the of the software playing. Thank you very much. Um, you. Uh, here's a small token of appreciation for your time and effort. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much.